first is the audiogram. This is mine right here. I feel sometimes like it should be shared, not necessarily a secret. I was five years old when I lost my hearing. Can you guess how I lost my hearing? Anyone? That's a hint over here on the right, yes. I listened to, my mom said, listen to the birds outside. And I said, what birds? I, I didn't understand what she was talking about. So we went to the audiologist and I had my hearing tested. So I'm fairly in the normal frequency until, or I can hear fairly well at normal frequency and high frequency, but then as you get to lower frequencies, I can't hear anything. My audiologist said that I shouldn't really see many effects from this. So we said, you can see here, it says preferential seating. And they were like, oh, lucky you. That's how they worded it. Oh, I felt lucky that I got to sit at the front and I was special. And then you can see good lip reading opportunities. And they again told me, lucky you. I didn't receive any assistance or accommodations or learn to sign at all. So I grew up having to lip read. My first memory of my hearing loss and when that hit me, does anyone know who this may be? Who is this person? <laughs> yes, the Hulk. I rem remember reading a kid's magazine related to TV. It's called TV 79. That was the year that I read the article in this little magazine. And I realized that I needed to read this myself. And there was a comment about him having hearing loss, the Hulk. I remember reading that and it said he grew up being teased and he was shy because of his hearing loss. That was the first time I remember seeing anyone else with a hearing loss. I had not been exposed to anyone deaf or hard of hearing prior to that. And I was so excited when I read this. I went to my parents and I showed them and I said, look, someone is just like me. So my parents read this article and told me that he has a real hearing loss and that mine was really nothing. It was no big deal. But he was actually hard of hearing or had a hearing loss. And I absolutely internalized that. I was eight years old at that time. So I thought, okay, I worked very hard to lip read and felt it was my responsibility to accommodate hearing people and those that I would interact with and that I needed to be able to read their lips and to speak clearly so that they could understand me. I, I'm jealous of some individuals who grew up with deaf families and they were exposed to sign language when they were young. <laughs> I, I think the Hulk basically kind of was my model. So I really could not hear very well. And I sat in the front of the classroom and fell in love with math. I remember the first time I learned about negative numbers. I was maybe 10 years old. And zero through nine I knew, but we could go backwards from zero and go into the negative. I was very excited about that fact. I felt like the adult world was hidden from me up until that point. <laughs> they kept that a secret. They kept it a secret, and I finally found this out. I went home, and I was just so excited about negative numbers. How many of you read often? Hmm. 
now when you read, I couldn't hear what people were reading. But in math, math is very clear. Reading a book is very clear, but spoken language was unclear to me. I couldn't completely hear it. Math and written words were black and white to me. I remember the first time I went to the library to the adult book section, and I was maybe 10 or 12 years old, and that section of the library was a new world for me, and I found books about math. <laughs> This is my bookometer <laughs> I use. Growing up in elementary school, middle school, and high school, I did well. I could read books instead of dealing with people, and I preferred it that way. Of course, that was in you know the 70s, 80s, etc. And teachers would read books. So you see over here um, is more focused on the books and reading. I was really a nerd, actually, at that time. I took AP exams. I was in AP English, Calculus 5. I got fives on my AP exams. And it came time to choose a college. And uh, do you remember how many colleges Peter applied to from his lecture? Do you remember how many colleges he said he applied to? Oh, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Smith. <laughs> yes, one. I did the same thing. I applied to one university in my home in my hometown. It was cheap. And that's where my family went to college. I could get a scholarship. I could be near my family. I thought that that would be the best thing to do. And it was a college of engineering. I thought, oh, all right. I, I love math. But I wasn't sure if I wanted to become a mathematician, because what can you do if you become a mathematician? You sit and do mathematics for your job, and that didn't necessarily make sense to me. So I thought, oh, engineering would be more clear. You build things. Great. I can do that. But really, my first very exciting moment in college <laughs> Does anyone recognize this? This was email. I entered college in 1989. Those of you new to college are very lucky. This is what email looked like at that time when I entered college. There were no friendly pictures before Google, those types of things. It was just text. And really, being hard of hearing, you can't communicate real well in person necessarily. And so I thought, oh, well, email would make things so much easier. It's just like reading a book. And we can have clear communication. I can contact others online. We can chat in a chat room. A variety of options. I was really kind of a nerd. I would sit at the computer and type and use that as a form of communication, which was fun for me. I had to choose a major. And I began as a chemical engineering major. Have any of you taken chemical engineering courses or chemistry courses? Did you enjoy them? Oh, I hated those classes. I had to work with my hands, with different chemicals, and I really could not find solutions or do that type of work. 
I really worked better with mathematics and on the computer. Is that the right sign for industrial? Okay, so industrial engineering is what I switched to, transferred to that major. Any of you taken any classes related to industrial engineering? You don't build anything with industrial engineering. You build a system to analyze another system. So these are the types of courses that I had to take. Operations research, queuing theory, quality control, and so on. Uh, statistics, design of experiments. Oh, my goodness. I finally, finally found my home when I took that design of experiments class. I needed to have this ASL1 class for a language credit. I couldn't hear well enough to go to a French or other spoken language class, so I decided to take ASL. And they told me, no, that I could not. Can you guess why they told me I could not take it? Because it wasn't a real language. Right, yes, it was not a language. So I read, I found research and showed them that it actually was a language, and so they changed their mind and let me take that for my language credit. And of course, ASL is much more popular now to, for students to take as their foreign language credit. I, I'm glad that they were willing to let me take this class. So I took one ASL course and then forgot it because I didn't use it on a daily basis. I didn't practice. I still would lip read and, and speak and try and, and use what hearing I had. So my book meter, you can see here, started to rise toward the people section a little bit. We had small classes. I was able to lip read a little bit better. But in college, the information becomes a lot more complex and the classes are larger, maybe with more auditorium type of participation with large classes and large numbers of students. And so it wasn't as easy for me to lip read. I was always tired because I had to struggle to lip read the teacher or I had to read my own information to catch up. And it became more complex and more difficult. I'm sure some of you have had that same experience. I have had a lot of work experience in my career, and this is some of the work that I did in college. Do you, are you aware of P&G, Procter & Gamble? I worked for them in Ohio. I went to Georgia, and I made Georgia, in Georgia, I made toilet paper. A lot of jokes, we'll just say. We had a lot of jokes in that job. <laughs> And I worked for two summers in a large faculty, factory, a large factory. We made hats and shoes. That was interesting work. The management told me that if I continued with that job, I could become a manager. So I would have to stop my engineering training and what I was planning to do to become a manager. But I really enjoyed math and the engineering type of work, not supervising. It was always about the profit and how much money you make. That's what that company seemed to be focused on, and I didn't really appreciate that. I didn't like that. So I then worked at a hospital. Tampa General Hospital in quality control. I was a statistician for the hospital, analyzed different systems that they had in place. And now I was helping people, right? Um, not necessarily. Again, the discussions came back to the money and the bottom line. They weren't worried about saving lives necessarily. They were cutting costs to be able to increase their profit. It was a wonderful hospital. I'm not blaming the hospital at all. Don't get me wrong. But still, that's, that's the typical mindset of companies.
And then I, I worked with a company who made electric types of equipment, electronic equipment, and I thought that would be great, but not so much. So then I worked as a tutor with Sylvan Learning Center. So, therein lies my problem. Here I am, nearing graduation, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't find anything I'd enjoyed to date, and that was a big problem for me. Here are my thoughts that I was thinking at the time. Okay, let's take more math classes. Let's stall until we figure out what we want to do. Right? Because I don't know what I want to do just yet. And I enjoy school, so why not pursue a PhD? But in what discipline? Industrial engineering, operations research, statistics? I didn't know. So I went to talk to my professors to ask what their opinion was, and they didn't know either. They said, it's really your choice. So it was a frustrating experience. I asked some other graduate students who were in different disciplines and they said don't do statistics. Statistics is a dead field. There's, there's nothing new to discover. It's, it was, you know, it reached its peak in the 50s. And they were wrong, but that's what they told me at the time. So luckily I ignored that advice and pursued statistics. Now, Dr. Smith, you applied to one school, right, Peter? Oh, Dr. Hauser, you applied to one. No, for graduate school, Peter says, I applied to many. Well, I had a list of eight schools, two that I can't remember, and the others you see listed here. And I was looking into schools that offered PhDs in statistics. So you see the ones listed here, and then, like I said on the bottom, two I couldn't remember. Does anyone know which college this is? Stanford, California. Stanford, mm -hmm. beautiful campus, right? So I was accepted there. Out of the eight universities, I was accepted at all of them, and that was very exciting. So I traveled and, and visited each of the campuses, and this was in March that I visited Stanford University in March. And I thought, wow, I like this place. This is good for March, right? That really was the only reason I picked it. it was, it's a beautiful school in a beautiful place. This is exactly what it looks like. But it's also a top school in doctoral studies for statistics, but I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so luckily, if I knew it was one of the top schools for statistics, I may not even have applied. I may have psyched myself out and been too afraid to try, but I didn't know it, and so I did pursue it, and I was accepted and got in. I went there, and it's a beautiful yeah. campus, so it was exciting all around. Overwhelming is all I can say about life as a stats student. I was overwhelmed. These are the courses that I took. I wasn't ready for any of them. My classmates were from places like Harvard. They were from countries like China, the top students in their countries and their schools. And then there was me, an engineering major from South Florida. And I was an American, Caucasian woman, and that seemed to help my application process. There were uh, a small cohort of us in my class. And uh, remedial math, again, I felt like I wasn't ready even for remedial math. But I took engineering courses, not math courses. So I really wasn't ready. So they placed me in remedial math to review some concepts and prepare myself for things like theoretical probability. Has anyone taken a theoretical probability course? It's not human. <laughs> it's not human, right? It's, it is so complicated. 
It's beautiful, but it's so complicated. Oh, well, there were also opportunities for teaching assistantships, lots of research seminars to attend, and plenty of all-nighters, barely getting by. And I was surrounded by professors and peers who were utterly brilliant people. So my office mate later went on to establish and found Zappos. Have you heard of Zappos? Now um, uh, that person is the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer. There was one time a friend who came to me and said, you got to see this cool thing. One of my computer science friends developed this for a class project. And so I took a look at it, and I saw the name Google. Now, I was a, this was a student at Stanford who developed Google for a class project. This was before it was Google as a company. And this was one of my other friends showing me what their friends did as a class project. So, Google. Do you know, it didn't start out as Google. What? Wait, let's see. Let me get this right. The word Google, G-O-O-G-O-O-G-O-L, means one with 100 zeros following it. That's G-O-O-G-O-L. So the Stanford people borrowed that translation and just changed a couple of the letters. And I thought, why on earth would they do that? Why would they need a search engine? We've got Yahoo. We don't need another one. This is ridiculous, I thought. But clearly it wasn't. So those were a lot of fun, all-nighters, and then ASL. I continued to learn ASL. And then my bookometer, right? These were very interesting days because my professors didn't follow the textbook. They were better than the textbook. They were the top professors in the field. And so their lectures were better than the book. If I could have heard them, they would have been better than the book. But they wrote on the board with their back to me, and I had no opportunity to lip read. And so I just gave up. It was a very, very difficult time. Not happy times at all. I became old very fast during those years. But there was teaching. And I found I enjoyed teaching. It was the first time I can recall standing in front of a class as a teacher assistant. Who's a TA here? Anybody do teaching assistant work? TA work? Anyone? Do you enjoy it? It's tough. Why is it tough? Why do you say that? Well, it's a lot. You really have to critically look at your skills in presenting, and you have to know the topic and the content and exactly communication. But I actually love the communication part of it. It was difficult. The first time I stood, I just was like, oh, this is awful. Everyone's eyes are on me. But I wanted to try it again and again, and I wanted to work on it until I got better at it. Uh, so the chairperson for the department was involved in a number of projects to try to improve teaching methods for the department. And so I was allowed to then teach my own course in statistics for medical students. And that was fun. And then there was research, which was a little different, not necessarily fun. This was my professor, Richard Olshan. Functional data analysis. Have you heard of that before? Who's taken statistical course, statistics courses? Oh, yeah. Biostatistics. That counts. Wow. Okay. You're missing an awesome experience. Let me just let you know that.
functional data analysis. You know, most of the time, data points are measured, like you can measure someone's height. It's factual information. And then you find the mean height within a group of numbers, and you divide it by how many participants information was gathered. And from that, you can plot curves of those points. Now, if your data follows a normal curve, that's one thing. Say you're um, gathering data with a group of people over time, that, and that information will change over time. The analysis of that changing data is called functional data analysis, and that's what those multiple plot points look like on one graph. So, it neared time to graduate, and I was faced with another problem. What do I do next? Why not a postdoc? At McGill University in Canada. Do you know which province? Montreal. Montreal, Canada, McGill University. And it's cold there. Very, very different than Stanford in California, but no less a beautiful campus. These were two of my professors. Jim Ramsey developed functional data analysis and authored a book on it. And Dan Levitin in the Department of Psychology worked with music. Interesting experiments. He had musicians that were videotaped while they were playing their instruments. And then the participants were divided into thirds. And one third of you saw the video with the accompanying music. And you had to write how you felt when you heard the music, if it caused tension or calming. And then another third of the participants did not see the video. They only heard the audio. And another third of the participants saw without the music. They just had to analyze the uh, visual image of the musician playing the instrument and how their body swayed through space and the effect that that had on the participants, pleasurable or otherwise. And these are the resulting curves from that data. And the addition of the visual aspect added to the participant experience. And so if you ever take statistics, this is what some of those graphs and whatnot will look like. But it's actually very interesting work. It was a very interesting research project. So. Let me take a moment and talk about this slide. My advisor was Dan. And I told him, I said, you know, I really want to write about statistics for a general audience. For people who haven't taken statistics, I want to write about statistics and do research for that audience. I think that would be cool. And he said, <laughs> no, that's not a good idea. That does not make for a successful academic career. Because if you write for a general audience, it won't help your career. It will actually hurt your career. And I was pretty upset by that, but I realized he was right. A traditional academic career doesn't, it's not well suited for writing for a general audience. So, once again, I came to a crossroads and had to decide what to do. So, sure, another graduate program, why not? Heading back to California.
Santa Cruz. Have any of you been to the area? Oh, it's beautiful. It's stunning. There are beaches. There are forests. It was a one-year program for people like myself who had a background in science, but who wanted to become writers. And so they had to learn, the point was to learn about how to write about science for a general audience. Here we go, was a scientist, became a science writer. One year program that changed everything. And I shifted from the world of math to the world of writing. And I wrote and wrote and wrote day upon day. Like once again, it was overwhelming. It was a brand new experience to me. And this was the coursework that I took. And what's happening to my bookometer? Uh, writing about, and you can read some of the articles, but I had to interview people to write my articles. I had to phone interview people. I had to interview people face to face. I had to interact with people. It was not good. It was, and you can, as you can see, it's getting closer to the red part where I'm interacting with people. But it was fun. It still was a lot of fun. Have any of you thought about writing as a possible career choice for a general audience? Writing for a general audience? Anybody? Have any of you thought about that as a career option? You did? I've thought about signing. I've thought about um, signing. Doing signed journalism. Well, that's very neat. We'll have to talk about that. Um, I write for my company. I, I write the newsletter for my company, okay. summarize the research that's been performed. That's for a general audience. Is that a blog, you mean? Do any of you do blogging or vlogging for science communication purposes? I would recommend, if any of you have an interest in that, please reach out to me because it really is fun. I can't tell you how much fun it is, how things are interpreted, how you take complex scientific and mathematical information and translate it so that it's applicable and understandable to the general audience. That's an amazing thing. The first year that I did that, I thought, how am I going to do this? How do you summarize and translate this information? But I wrote for the Herald newspaper in Monterey County, which is a very general audience. And I wrote about things like, not statistics and not engineering, but things like you see on the slide here. So now, this was the first time I really enjoyed myself working, doing this type of work. Are, are any, any of you uh, aware of PNAS? They're the third most popular journal, or most well-known journal. So at that point, I became a science writer. And these were new members of the National Association of Science. They wrote about their lives, about their work. It was very fun. But I wasn't sure who actually read this journal. And I missed the fish and the sex of the, you know, their mating practices and everything. So I was chatting with a friend one day. And they asked me if I had no money. I mean, if money was not a problem, what would I want to do? So I just said what was off the top of my head. I would write, I would teach, and I would make the world a better place for deaf people. This was kind of odd for me. I'm not sure where that came from. Yes, I had a hearing loss. And I dealt a lot with the hearing world and was becoming frustrated with it, but this was still a new idea for me. So I sat down and Googled. 
DC, because I wanted to live there, PhD, job statistics. So Gallaudet University popped up. The world is very funny how it leads our paths. Well, I knew that I couldn't really sign very well, but I could become a part of the deaf community if I went to Gallaudet University. Oh, my first year. Do you remember in 2006? Do you remember what happened that year at Gallaudet? Anyone? Yes, a protest. There was a protest in 2006. <laughs> this is one of my students <laughs> here in the front. I tried to go into my building at 7.30 in the morning. Tried to go into my office and the building was blocked. All the students were out front blocking my building with arms locked together. I told them I was trying to go in and they told me that I could not go, that they were protesting. Oh, I thought my plants were going to die. My plants in my office, yes. It was so sad. My plants died. It was unfortunate. I think we were closed for two weeks or something. They closed campus. It was closed. And really, I couldn't sign well at that time, so I wasn't familiar with the, the um, issues that were happening. And I was an outsider. People weren't very friendly with me. I was trying to be neutral. But it was a very odd time at the time that I entered Gallaudet. But not all of the faculty, well, all the new faculty that began at the same time as I did, who started working there, left. All of the new ones. But I am the lone survivor of that group that began working at that time. I started, I started teaching developmental math. That was the position, I, the position I began in, but it wasn't my passion. So I transferred to the statistics department and began teaching statistics. You should all come to Gallaudet and take my statistics course. It's a lot of fun. And it will include the topic of sex. I use a lot of sex data for my class, um, penile data, other types of sexual data for my class. So my students will come in, and I tell them we'll play with data, data and I, they ask what we're going to study, and I say penis size. That's the data we're going to work with. So please come join my class. You'll enjoy it. And you'll see my bookometer is a big smiley face. I no longer had to worry about trying to hear the people who I spoke with or lip read them, but I now, of course, am still a little bit weak on my sign expressive skills, but my receptive skills are very good. So, remember, I wanted to write. That was the item number two I would do if money was no op op option or problem. So I contacted several different people. At, I was a freelance writer. In LA Times, I wrote some articles often for LA Times. They told me that they wanted me to write new articles, new topics, and I had some options. All the options were pretty boring until I came to orgasm. And I thought, okay, orgasm it is. So that started a new kind of minor field for me in writing about sex, the science of sex. You can see this title here, Bigger is Not Always Better. This was actually banned on Facebook. But this is a picture from an actual scientific study. 
it was all women participants and they saw a picture projected and it was pictures of different males that had been edited. They changed for the height, the torso size and shoulder width, and then penis size. They adjusted for those three factors. And then they asked the women participants how attracted they were to each. And then I analyzed that data. And I did find that when the size increased, the attractiveness did not necessarily increase after a certain level. It went up to a point, but then after that point, it didn't continue to go up, but it peaked and then declined. Uh, yes, uh, you'll have to look at the article. And the, uh, the, um, the authors of this study did not actually get to that point. I did the calculations and the analysis to come to this conclusion. Anyhow, then the science of the orgasm. And then insects. Is that the same sign as orgasm? Okay, it's a little bit different. You have to... All right. So, okay, so this is one way to sign orgasm, and then you can sign a different hand shape to show an insect or a bug. So, female insects have a penis. I found this to be much more varied and much more fun than traditional statistics. I also did statistics and wrote about important things such as cancer advocacy, genetics, the p-value. Those are some things. Those are statistics as well. But I also did some research and writing on sex. So the important thing is that I wrote an article for Nature about issues that are most common in statistical measures. Are you aware of p-value? Anyone? Some of you? Okay. Oh, well. That's one way that, the most common way that we find out if, if uh, research is accurate or not. So I wrote many articles regarding the p-value and explaining how it can be used and misused. Are you aware of Twitter? Any of you use Twitter? I, I uh, searched on Twitter and this came back. How many times it had been discussed. And this article that I wrote was actually one of the top read articles in the Nature magazine or Nature Journal. And there were over uh, one out of five million outputs. And then it has been tweeted over 11,000 times. I thought it was crazy. It was about p-values. Who would have thought? I couldn't imagine that would be such a popular topic. This is still tweeted every day. And I think that that shows the power of writing for a general audience. It really does. Because in actuality, no one is reading a textbook about statistics. So if you write for a general audience in a fun way, the information will be disseminated much more widely. 
And this person said that they were mind blown. There was one in-depth subject for statistics that I took and made appropriate and applicable for a general topic or a general audience. I've written many articles regarding research itself and uh, how you can fool yourself in data analysis. I also wrote articles related to statistics for a general audience. These are some of the most popular articles that I've written. My articles are another thing that convinced the ASA to write a white paper. I think, it, okay, it was a policy paper about p-values, more like a policy paper, and it was very influential. And now we are trying to change research to date. And this was, I, I facilitated a group of 16 top researchers and we came together. It was a very fun event and activity. And traditional work was not good for me. I, I needed to follow my heart and follow my gut. I thought, why not do that and go with my passion? And this is what it has led to. I do want to mention cochlear implant. My audiogram you can see here has changed over time. So I thought, again, why not do this? Next step. This was a, a uh, uh, the top is a Facebook post. Can you read it from here? So I appreciated that process. It was a new experience for me. So I'm now writing more about deafness, and I'm doing more writing in general, more st statistical writing, and writing for a general audience to include laypersons. I'm involved in more statistics at Gallaudet, and I'm not sure what else is next. Thank you so much.